Ladies and gentlemen, good evening and a very warm welcome to Brooklyn um, and a warm welcome especially to our guests this evening. Um, I first met John a couple of years ago at a Winkle Brown reception here at Brooklyn. Um, I invited John to come along and meet Eric and afterwards he said, if there's anything I can do to help, those fatal words and those people that know me well never say it to me. The rest is history, so will you please welcome John Ty. There at the end of the runway is Concord 001 and Interlouse has joined Raymond Baxter. Just seconds to go. He must go off the look on your boat. 110 tons of aircraft all up, wait there. The magic moment with us. The crescendo of time from the 593 Olympus is... The Concorde was special. The quality of the work, the minds, the skill, the talent, the commitment that went into it, that's what really matters. Over the last 27 years, Concorde has captured the imagination of people from all over the world. An extraordinary feat of engineering, a unique blend of power, grace, and beauty. It's the first time I've ever been in the air. I've never driven it going in because I'm retired. the Sydney Opera House, and there's Concord, arguably the three most beautiful man-made sites in the world. We have carried the Queen, the Queen Mother, world leaders, stars. It has been an amazing magnet. Phil Collins had dashed from the Wembley stage to Philadelphia by helicopter and Concord. It's good fun. I mean, only a fool such as I would do this. For 27 years, British Airways Concord has been a national symbol natural centerpiece for celebration. A few hundred feet over the heads of a million people, maybe more, Concord and the Red Arrows fill the sky. We flew down the Mall and you could see Her Majesty standing on the balcony. I've never seen a million people before, let alone them all looking up and waving and cheering for Concord. She's brought cities together, brought people closer and reminded us all that we can do extraordinary things. You kind of think, oh, I wonder who might be on Concord, maybe a famous film star who's just signed a contract in New York or something. Catherine Sister Jones is an absolute star, so glamorous, so Hollywood. Paul McCartney's probably everyone's favorite. He will say hello and he remembers us. Oh, Richard Gere. I have loved him since I was about five. You can always recognise it, and it looks like a swan. You know, when swans fly, it looks like a swan with the shape of its neck. It's the most brilliant example of far-sighted designers thought ahead and kept a lead for half a century. No matter how many times you fly, there still is that amazing, exciting sensation when you take off. Every day is a thrill. By the time the passengers come on board, the air is absolutely charged with excitement. Speedbird Concord 1, you're clear for takeoff. 27 left, surface wind, 240 at 10. Speedbird Concord 1, Roger, clear for 
the takeoff to seven left. It's a thrill. It's the nearest thing I'll ever feel to a rocket. Power starts to bite. Push back into your seat. Gatsby's building. You're concentrating like mad. 60 knots. The noise takes over. 100 knots. That's it. Heart starts to pound a bit. V1. Rotate. V2. For 27 years, she has been our flagship, and her inspiration will stay with us as we take our standards of service still higher and higher. Ladies and gentlemen, despite the slight problem on the audio there, I give you Concord. I would suggest the greatest icon of the 20th century. Uh, my name is John Tai. I'm a training captain with uh, British Airways on the Boeing 777 fleet at the moment. Uh, but I'm here this evening to talk a little bit about the Boeing 777, but more than anything, about Concord. Uh, she first flew, as you've just seen there, in uh, March of 1969. And uh, just a few weeks later, in the July of that year, the Americans put a man on the moon for the first time. Now, the guys at NASA have actually said, uh, albeit privately, that they think that what we did with Concorde was a greater technical achievement than their moon landings. I'll tell you about how I got the opportunity to become a Concorde pilot. I'll tell you about what's involved in the training to become a Concorde pilot what it's like to fly Concorde on the supersonic transatlantic route structure. I'll tell you about some of the people I met along the way, some of the fun we had, and inevitably we'll touch on that tragic accident in the summer of 2000. Before going on to talk about the sterling work of the team that returned to service just a year later, leading on to her eventual retirement in 2003. So ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Brooklands. There is no finer place to be talking about Concorde. Here is the birthplace of motorsport and aviation in the UK. It's also the home of Concorde, and indeed now home to the world's only operational Concorde flight simulator. The picture you see in the bottom right-hand corner is the fuselage of Concorde under construction on this very site here at Brooklands, and more than 30% of each airframe was built here which I understand is more than any other factory. So there is no finer place to be talking about Concorde. For me, it was very much a dream come true. Uh, I grew up locally. I was born in Sunbury. I went to school in Hampton, Hampton Grammar as it uh, was then. And about 50 years ago, uh, my dad built me my first airband radio. So in the days when Heathrow had four runways, they're now fighting to get a third, but in those days, I sat in my bedroom window watching the aeroplanes come into land at Heathrow and listening to the pilots on that home-built radio. So the passion was there for me from a, a very early age. And once I was at Hampton School, I was a keen aircraft spotter. Probably shouldn't admit to that. Uh, but spent many lunchtimes and weekends at uh, the Queen's Building at Heathrow. And then on the 21st of January, 1976, I went with uh, a school friend of mine, Graham, who's here tonight, we went to uh, Heathrow and we stood by the perimeter fence at Hatton Cross and we watched the world's first ever supersonic commercial flight depart from runway 28 left at Heathrow. At 11.40 that morning, the British Airways Concorde took off at exactly the same time as Air France were doing the same thing in Paris. We flew to Bahrain and they flew to uh, Rio de Janeiro with a fuel stop at uh, Dakar. So that was the launch of supersonic air travel. Now, quite how Graham and I came to be out of school at 11.40 on a Wednesday morning, <laughs> I can't remember, but we'll gloss over that bit. So those photographs, the actual pictures I, I took on that day. Just a few months later, I uh, completed my A-levels and I left school. I had a place at City University and I was going to go and study engineering. 
But just after school holidays started, there was an advertisement on Capital Radio. British Airways were recruiting clerks in their accounts department. So I applied and I joined British Airways in August 1976. It was meant to be a summer holiday job before going to, u to university, but 40 years later, I'm still here. Uh, I never went to university. I did various ground jobs uh, within the airline. And I think the most inspirational was the one, it uh, was my second job in the airline. And uh, I had to run around and put all the maps and the books and the charts and the flight deck of Concorde, as in the flight deck of all of our aeroplanes, in, including Concorde. And in fact, three of the aeroplanes that I actually worked on are out here in this museum, which just shows how long ago it was, the Viscount, the Vanguard, and the VC-10. I went on all those, putting all the maps and books on. I was about 19 years old. I had a uniform, uh, drove a van, a walkie-talkie. I got to go on aeroplanes, flirt with stewardesses, and meet pilots. Who would give that up to go to university? So I stayed. Um, I met a couple of pilots who live around the corner in Sunbury from our family home, and they seem to have a pretty good lifestyle. Uh, and one of them took me on a, a flight on a Vanguard, actually, down to Turin and back, as you could in those days. And that was the moment I thought, yeah, this is the job I want. So I spent uh, many hours instructing uh, at the British Airways Flying Club, getting my pilot's licence. And in 1987, I qualified as a, British, as a commercial pilot. Now, I didn't have enough experience to stay on within British Airways, flying airliners. Uh, but I applied and I got accepted by Dan Air. And I had two great years with Dan Air flying the Boeing 727 around the charter uh, network of Europe. In 1989, uh, a couple of years later, I, by then I got enough hours, enough experience, and I applied to British Airways and uh, I came back joining them straight onto the Boeing 747 fleet based at Gatwick. We were known as the Beach Fleet because all we did was go to the Caribbean and the Seychelles and Mauritius. It was a tough job, but somebody had to do it. Uh, and in fact, it's gone pretty much full circle. That's most of what I do now back on the Boeing 777. Now, once you're within British Airways and you're flying one of their airplanes, you can, you can bid, you can put your name on a list to transfer fleets after a certain period of time on your first aircraft. And I put my name down straight away on the waiting list for Concorde. It was a very long list and it moved very slowly. It was, after all, the most sought after job in aviation. Some nine years later, I was offered a, course, a place on course number 28. Uh, to put that in significance, uh, there really had only been 27 previous training courses in the 23 years that the aeroplane had been operating. They had um, quite a few near the beginning when they were building up operations, but really that's about one training course a year. Uh, and for example, on the um, 777, we're starting a training course every day at the moment. We're training well over 700 people a year at the moment on the Boeing 777. And uh, so there have been thousands and thousands of subsonic pilots within British Airways, uh, but there has only ever been 134 uh, pilots who flew Concorde uh, in the UK. So it really was a tremendous privilege. Still can't believe it actually happened sometimes. So I'm going to tell you about the, uh, the training course. Well, first of all, to be um, selected to go on to the uh, Concorde fleet, yeah, there's a bit of a selection process in that if you were transferring, for example, from the Airbus to the Boeing 777 within British Airways, it's just a question of seniority. You join the airline and you go on the bottom of the list. Uh, I think if you join today, you'll be about number 4,020. And uh, as people retire and, and you slowly move your way up the list, and it's all just done on seniority. So if you had the seniority to transfer from a short haul job on the Airbus, for example, to the Boeing 777, your number would come up. The same thing happened on Concorde, but once people were on Concorde, they very rarely moved off. It was normally retirement or promotion to a captain, so there weren't many opportunities to, to get across there. But there was also a very slight selection process. It wasn't just a numbers game. I think the expression they used was that you had to be deemed to be suitable. And um, you had to, I remember being stopped in the corridor uh, one day by our chief pilot, uh, Captain Mike Bannister, and he said, uh, John, your name cropped up this morning in our uh, morning meeting, and I was asked if you were suitable. And I said, uh, oh, what did you tell him, Mike? And he said, well, I'll let him know when your check's cleared. And, um, <laughs> and that was my selection process for Concord. Uh, in all seriousness, you did have to have a, a fairly good track record because it was a very tough training course, and I'm going to talk you through that a little bit at the moment. And if you'd had a borderline uh, track record, you probably wouldn't be able to get through the training course. You'd probably come in and have a little chat about your history, and then you might withdraw your application. 
Um, so it was, was a, a, a bit of a selection process, but a, a very tough training course. Now, if you were doing a training course under the Boeing 777, for example, you turn up at our highly modern training centre now, you'd go into a classroom, you'd switch a computer on, you'd hit go, and you'd teach yourself. It's a computer-based training system, and you'd probably spend about 10 days in this room uh, learning about the electrics, the hydraulic systems, and all the technical aspects of the, of the Boeing 777, and um, you'd then sit an exam. Uh, and, and that whole ground school would last probably about 10 days. On Concord, it was six weeks. It was all down at Filton uh, in uh, Bristol, where British Aerospace had their training centre and the Concord flight simulator there, and they ran the course for us. It was all... Um, Collars and ties, that's because we were allowed to use the management dining room at lunchtime, treated like uh, VIPs, and yeah, it was pretty intense. We'd go down on a Sunday night, uh, pitch up in the classroom first thing Monday morning, back to the hotel in the evening for studying and prep for the next day. It was a really, really tough course. So that's a picture of our course at work, the instructor Roland, a great guy. There's, uh, on that course there's two captains, they're the two sitting near the front, something to do with age and eyesight, I suspect. Um, the next two are the two flight engineers who are on our course, something to do with their passion for all things technical, I suspect, and us two lazy co-pilots sitting at the back uh, as, as was the right place. Now, Roland Dow, our instructor here, had a particular talent. And if I just zoom in on the blackboard, you might see that he was able to write backwards on the board, writing mirror writing. Top right-hand corner, if you haven't spotted already. So after we'd finished our grand school, then we moved on to the uh, simulator phase of the course. And there's the simulator in use at Filton on the left-hand side. And on the right-hand side, there it is, arriving at Brooklyn's Museum, where it sits here today. It's open to the public. You can go and fly that simulator. So we'd spend about 14 sessions, four-hour sessions on that simulator. It's pretty heavy going. It was an hour and a half's briefing before you went into the simulator and a serious debriefing session afterwards. We'd cover all the normal... Uh, procedures on the aeroplane, flying it subsonically, flying it supersonically, and uh, we'd learn how to handle all the abnormal and emergency procedures that we could anticipate uh, hopefully not having on the aeroplane, but we had to be trained to handle all that. Now, to put that into comparison, if you were doing a similar course on a Boeing 777, uh, there'd be anything between six and ten simulator sessions, depending on your background, so a minimum of 14 on Concorde. So those training captains, they were pretty tough characters, and I now am one on the Boeing 777. Um, they put us through all kinds of emergencies, everything, they, anything they could think of. But I think they went a little bit over the top if they had anything to do with setting fire to the hotel the night before our final exam. And uh, it really was quite a mess. So that was quite a distraction during our training course. When we'd finished the simulator phase, we still had quite a lot to do. We had the best part of the training, the best fun you could ever have. We'd go off and do what they call base training. Now, if you're doing a Boeing 777 training course, your simulator uh, training would include flying circuits and bumps in the simulator. The simulators nowadays are so good, they're what they call zero flight time rated, which means that you do literally all your training in the simulator. As long as you've come from a, another airliner or you've joined British Airways from the Royal Air Force as, as we're recruiting at the moment. So the first time you would actually fly the real aeroplane would be on a passenger carrying flight from A to B. I recently uh, did a training flight to Orlando and I had a pilot with me who joined us straight from the Royal Air Force. He'd never been, he'd never been set foot on a Boeing 777. He'd never flown a civilian airliner. And that was his first flight with a training captain uh, the simulators are that good that they can, we can do that nowadays. Concorde was very different to fly, and, and the simulator, was, whilst very good, was never zero flight time rated. So we had, it was a hell of a job, we had to go off base training and do circuits and bumps on the Concorde. We went to Seville on ours. Uh, we needed a long runway, we needed good weather, and we needed somewhere that was fairly quiet, because I'm sure you know Concorde made a fair old racket. And if it was blasting around the circuit for several hours a day, it was sure as hell going to upset the, uh, upset the locals uh, if, we, if there was too many people around. So clearly Heathrow, it was not a suitable place to, to go doing that. Now we'd started off in Shannon, which is where we normally do our base training. And uh, we'd set off up there, but we do need that good weather. And Shannon does actually have a good weather record, but in, in the January of 1999, uh, this would have been, um, the weather wasn't very good. We sat around, we did a few circuits, but we sat around for quite a while doing some planning, <laughs> uh, 
drinking a fair bit of Guinness. And, and this is pre-internet days, really. Uh, so literally, we sat there for a while. The weather wasn't going to improve. So the training captains literally got out a map of Europe and tried to find a suitable place uh, that we could take the aeroplane. Again, we needed a long runway, it needed to be quiet, needed good weather, and we needed uh, friendly locals that we weren't going to upset. So they came up with Seville. Uh, the aeroplane had never been there before, so it was like going back to 1969. Thousands of people turned out to see us. There were three TV crews on site in no time at all. And um, in fact, that's me taxiing out and the picture on the left on my very first takeoff on Concorde. And after doing my first circuit, just as we only did one circuit, just as the sunset, parked the aeroplane up, and it was quite an emotional feeling, as you could probably imagine. I couldn't string two words together, but I turned around, and there's a TV crew coming into the flight deck to interview me live on Spanish television as to what it was like to fly a Concorde for the first time. So that was a very quick introduction to the PR aspects of the job as well. Um, so base training in Seville, yeah, it really was uh, quite something. Your first ever takeoff, you never forget it. We've practiced it all in the simulator, time and time again. It's a very precise exercise. It starts with the three pi or the two pilots and the flight engineer starting their stopwatches. Uh, you'll hear, hopefully, if the audio works a bit better on the next video clip, uh, us going through uh, a circuit um, in the Concorde, and you'll hear that it's a very precise exercise. It starts off with three, two, one, now. Then you'll hear things like power set, 100 knots, V1, rotate. There's lots of speaking parts. My first words after the three, two, one now were unscripted, and I certainly couldn't repeat them here this evening because my mum's here. <laughs> but I can, you can imagine what they were. So it's full power with reheat. There's flames leaping out the back of those Rolls-Royce Olympus engines. Absolutely phenomenal acceleration as you go charging down the runway. The simulator can't prepare you for the noise the smell of the kerosene coming in through the air conditioning and the bouncing of the flight deck. If you still look at the flight deck, it's 37 feet in front of the nose wheel, so the slightest bump in the runway and you're bouncing up and down. It really is just a phenomenal experience. So here's me just taxiing out, or about to taxi out. That's my first ever takeoff. It really does go like a proverbial rocket and an even bigger grin when I got back again. It was absolutely uh, tremendous. Now what's different about takeoff on Concorde is that all the weight is on the wheels until rotate. So what that means, if you, if you were doing a takeoff on a Boeing 777, for example, next time you go on holiday, you might be sitting in a place called economy class, I think they call it. I think you can, I think you can see the wings from there. And when you're taking off, you sit out and look at the wings, you'll see that they gradually, they gradually lift up as you're accelerating down the runway. They bend. They're starting to take the weight off the wheels of the aeroplane as soon as you're accelerating. That lift that you need to get the aeroplane into the air starts to form as soon as you start moving. And it gets greater and greater the faster you're going until eventually there's enough lift to take the aeroplane into the air. With Concorde, that's very different. There is no lift until you get to something like 200 miles an hour. So the aeroplane weighs something like 180 tonnes on a scheduled flight to New York, and all that weight is on the tyres. And that'll become relevant when we talk um, about events later on. So you're charging down the runway and then you get to something like 200 miles an hour and you ease back on the uh, control column. And only then does the lift kick in. It's what we call vortex lift. That big delta wing that Concorde's fitted with has no flaps, no slats. And uh, it, as you increase the angle of attack, you get these big vortices that build up on top of the wing. And you'll see those in the next video clip, because whenever Concorde was flying on a, a damp day, you'd see the vortices forming on top of the wing. And those vortices would literally suck the aeroplane into the air. And this vortex lift, as we call it, is what would keep the aeroplane flying until the speed got up to something like 250 miles an hour. And then conventional lift, just like the 777, uh, would start to work more efficiently and uh, carry on from there. So that first ever takeoff was absolutely phenomenal. We're aiming to climb into the circuit with full power and reheat. And when we're flying it empty at Seville as we were then, the aircraft is very light. It goes like a rocket. And the, attempt, the idea is to level off at 2,000 feet and then turn downwind into the circuit. The training captains, I was told, ran a book on the greatest altitude reached by a trainee Concorde pilot on his first takeoff in his attempt to stop at 2,000 feet. 
and I was told the record stood at 7,300. <laughs> it was absolutely unbelievable. So then we turned down wind, and uh, I don't know if any of you fly small airplanes, but in a circuit in a small airplane, you might fly downwind at about a, 100 miles an hour, 110 miles an hour. In Concord, we're doing 250 knots, 280 miles an hour. So it's very quick. It's not long before you're coming round to make your first landing. Now, landing on Concorde is, is, uh, is different. It, they, as I've said, the airplane is fitted with no flaps or no slats. Now, again, on conventional subsonic airplanes, you have these devices, which the flaps are at the back of the wings and the slats are at the front of the wings. And when you're taking off or landing, we extend them to increase the area of the wing, change the shape of the wing to get more lift so we can fly uh, efficiently at low speeds. Concorde isn't fitted with those. They're too heavy take up a lot of engineering to make them work, and the incredible Delta wing was designed such that it could fly at low speeds and it could fly at twice the speed of sound. But to replace the lift we would get from the flaps and the slats, we'd have to lower the, low, lower the nose and visor to 12 and a half degrees nose down because the aeroplane was actually a very high nose up attitude. We'd come in with the aircraft pointing 10 and a half degrees up in the air, not 10, not 11. We had to fly this aeroplane very precisely. So clearly, if we didn't have the nose lowered to more than 10 and a half degrees, we wouldn't be able to see the runway. So that's what that was all about. Now on a 777, if you watch one of those coming into land at Heathrow, the nose up attitude is, is more like two degrees. So this really is coming in at, with the nose really high in the air. Still flying at an angle down a glide slope of three degrees, but uh, pointing really high in the air with the nose and visor lowered. Now coming in to land on a conventional aeroplane, as you came over the runway, you would pull back on the control column or the side stick if you're flying a, an Airbus, close the throttles and just raise the nose very slightly by about two or three degrees just to reduce the rate of descent to sink the aircraft gently onto the runway with a perfect touchdown, of course, so that the passengers give you a tremendous round of applause. <laughs> on Concord, you go through similar actions, but for a slightly different reason. As you come over the runway, the big delta wing tends to squeeze the air between the wing and the runway, going into what we call ground effect. And a byproduct of that is the nose tends to tip forward. So what we're doing is actually a very similar manoeuvre. We close the throttles because we don't need the power anymore, and we're pulling back on the stick, but not to raise the nose. We mustn't raise the nose. Next time you look at Concorde carefully, you'll see there's a very small wheel fitted to the back of the fuselage. It's there for a very good reason, in case we got this wrong. So you're closing the throttles, you're pulling back on the stick, but the idea is to maintain that 10 and a half degrees nose up attitude uh, all the way down until the aircraft is on the ground. And then you're still sitting some 40 feet above the ground and you've got to fly the nose wheel down. And then once you're on the ground, we always use full reverse thrust and heavy braking. Not because Concorde was landing at any greater speed or any significantly greater speed than subsonic aeroplanes, but the fact it was fitted with, uh, it was the first aeroplane to be fitted with carbon brakes. Technology that now we take for granted in modern aeroplanes and high-performance sports cars, but Concorde was the first. So those carbon brakes are designed to be used very aggressively. So full reverse thrust and heavy braking. And we would warn the passengers uh, about that before, uh, before landing. So that was landing, um, take off and landing, our first ever circuits on Concorde. We'll see if the audio on this video clip works, which shows you base training in Shannon. We're very, very pleased to welcome Captain Mike Bannister and his fellow crew to Shannon. One of the best training airfields in the world. Absolutely. It's early August and we've just arrived in Shannon in Southern Ireland for the first part of our training program. And what we'll be doing is concentrating on takeoffs and landings, flying circuits. Speedbird Alpha Foxtrot, clear touch and go, we're on my 24, right hand visual circuit, wind check 350 degrees, 09 knots. It takes about five to six minutes. Now 
we get up to around 300 miles an hour and then come back in, slow down, touch down and roll along the runway and take off again. Well, all the crew have performed brilliantly. We've got absolutely all that we needed to be done. So overall, a really successful couple of days. Um, but that was base training in Shannon, but we were so fortunate to be doing it in Seville, uh, in the sunshine. And your first ever land flying, uh, takeoff and landing on Concorde was indeed a very, very special day. There was a whole team of us. There's quite, there were only six of us under training. There were the two captains, the two first officers, and the two flight engineers. But because we did base training so rarely, there were training captains training other training captains, and examiners checking out training captains, checking out training captains. And not in that picture, there was all the engineers and support staff, and I think there probably a few along for a bit of a jolly as well, but uh, getting a few days out in Spain. But uh, we were there for about three or four days, uh, we were made very welcome by the, uh, all the locals, certainly in the local hostilleries as well, and uh, we got all our training done uh, in the time that was allocated to us. So graduation day was a very special day. So at the end of that, we're now qualified Concorde pilots. There's a lot of paperwork to be done and, uh, and checks to be written, but the Civil Aviation Authority then sends you your licence with the word Concorde written on it, and that's a very special thing to receive. You haven't finished yet though, so we then go on to flying on the line, flying on the routes uh, under supervision. So I'll take you through some of the, uh, the route flying now. Uh, you'd normally do at least 16 flights with uh, one of them pesky training captains uh, until you were let loose, just to get used to the, the route structure, the different weather, flying Concorde in the real world really. Um, so by the time I joined the Concorde fleet, towards the end really in 1998, uh, by then we were just flying uh, scheduled services twice a day to New York and uh, once a week to Barbados. In the earlier days, of course, we'd been going to Bahrain, which is the first destination, on to Singapore. We flew to Miami, Washington, Dallas, all of scheduled services, but uh, by the time I joined the fleet, it was those two. Some of my colleagues on um, the uh, Boeing 777, when I, they heard I was keen to go on the Concorde, they said, what do you want to do that for? It only goes to New York. And uh, because lifestyle and the variety of destinations is a big thing for an airline pilot. But my passion for the aeroplane was such that that didn't bother me. New York's a great place. And when we went to Barbados, we just did that during the winter season. And that was six months long. And we did some extra ones during the summer. The, only aer the aeroplane only went there once a week. So we would leave Heathrow at 9.30 on a Saturday morning, get to Barbados at 8.30 on a Saturday morning, an hour before you've left, that, of course, is why Concorde pilots always look so young. They're gay you know, every time we go to work. Um, and then we'd have a week in Barbados and come home again. Uh, I didn't actually have a problem with that. That worked, uh, worked pretty good for me. So that was the line flying, and we do that under supervision in initially. And we also did lots of um, ad hoc charters. In the early days, the aeroplane used to go around the world on three-week tours. Used to go take people to... Um, Cairo to see the pyramids and back in the day did some very, very special charters. Uh, some of my favourite ones were Birmingham and then to Greenland uh, and I did the uh, Millennium Fly Pass. That was a real precision exercise uh, on Millennium Eve. We had to fly over the, the London Eye exactly as the fireworks finished. That was a pretty precision uh, exercise involved in that. Uh, we did it with an empty aeroplane with Captain Mike Bannister and the flight engineer actually was a guy called Keith Brotherhood who I was in the Boy Scouts with you know, all those years ago. Well, it was quite a small world. So um, we do uh, all our training on the scheduled services to New York. We'd fly at least 16 uh, flights under supervision and then we'd be let loose to do the, the Barbados trips and the, the ad hoc charters. So along the way, uh, we'd meet some people. Yeah, it was kind of a, a bit of a glamorous job as well. Uh, I remember I went to, um, I hadn't been on the Concorde fleet that long, and I went to uh, Wembley Stadium to see Elton John in concert with 100,000 other people. It was a fantastic night. And then a few days later, I was flying Concorde to New York. I left the flight deck to go for a wander about in the cabin and bumped into Elton John in the, in the galley and we had a little chat. That just seemed quite weird, really. <laughs> Um, 
Other people I've met there, uh, Mick Jagger used to fly regularly with us to Barbados. Uh, very nice, quiet chap. He just used to like to sit at the back and read his book and have a glass of water. Very rock and roll. And um, Chris Tarrant, yeah, I remember one day uh, I was getting ready to go to work to fly the 10.30 flight to New York. And our house was like any other house on a Monday morning. Very busy, everybody rushing around, girls getting ready to go to school, dad getting ready to go to work, albeit to fly Concorde to New York. Not enough time. And naturally, my youngest came down and said, um, Daddy, what time does your flight go? And I said, uh, well, 10.30, the same as always, darling. Why? She said, well, I've just been listening to Chris Tarrant on Capital Radio, and he's, uh, he's going to New York with you this morning. He's going to be leaving the studio shortly, uh, riding on a motorbike to Heathrow and catching your Concorde flight. And I thought, well, you better be quick, because we're not, not going to wait for him. And sure enough, when, we got to, uh, when I got to work, we were given a little briefing and told that, uh, yeah, Capital Radio were sending a team with Chris and his assistant. And they'd actually asked if they could do a live link up with the aeroplane so that we could, they, he could broadcast live from the aeroplane onto Capital Radio. And they'd looked at it technically and, and uh, it was going to be at a period of very high workload for the pilots as we were preparing to go supersonic. And um, they'd said, no, British Airways had said, no, it's, it's not really uh, appropriate, we can't redo it. But as it happened, I was the extra pilot on that flight. The CAA inspector was flying that day, so I was along as a safety pilot just to keep an eye on things. And so I went back and I said to Chris Tarrant, uh, if you want, we can do this live link up now because there's four of us instead of the normal three, so we can manage it. And as he took a sip of his uh, champagne, he said, well, John, thanks ever so much. It's really kind of you, but we've already done it. And my family were at home listening on the radio and the, the DJ that came on after Chris Tarrant said, um, and now we're going to go live to Chris Tarrant on the flight deck of Concord. How's it going up there, Chris? And you could hear the rush of noise and the engines in the background. And he said, absolutely fantastic. The reheats have just gone on and we're supersonic. We're heading out over the Atlantic Ocean. It was all recorded in the studio the day before. <laughs> the tricks of radio, eh? But what was Chris was doing that day was, was uh, say, leaving his breakfast show in London, flying to New York. And he could only do this on Concorde. He was getting to New York an hour before he'd left London so he could do another breakfast show live in New York. Uh, and by then, my girls were coming out of school and he gave them a nice mention on the radio and said he'd been very well looked after uh, by their dad. Uh, a quick story about Paul McCartney, then I'll move on. But he was everybody's favourite. Everybody wanted to meet Paul McCartney. Very friendly, lots of fun. Uh, I used to carry uh, autograph books for my girls and they put a little... A picture of themselves in school uniform in the front of the books and wrote something like, Dear passenger, I, I hope you enjoy your flight. Will you write something in my autograph book? And, and Paul McCartney drew cartoons and you know, wrote all sorts of stuff and so did all the other people I could tell you about. But uh, there had been, we're such a small group and if anything significant happens, we'd all hear about it. And a couple of weeks prior to the flight I'm going to tell you about, uh, Paul McCartney had been on a flight to New York. And the captain was actually one of the chaps I trained with, very straight-laced, very proper sort of guy. And he had a hobby of collecting guitars, which didn't seem to go with his personality. But um, one of the stewardesses came into the flight deck in the cruise and said, oh, Captain, uh, one of our passengers, without saying who it was, has also got a few guitars. And he asked if he can come and visit you in the flight deck. And the captain said, yes, yep, yep, show the gentleman in. This will be fine. I'm not, not too busy at the moment. So Paul McCartney bowled into the flight deck with his guitar. And there they were, Mach 2, twice the speed of sound, on the edge of space, faster than the speeding bullet, and all that sort of stuff you've heard before. And uh, Paul McCartney said, uh, hey Skip, I hear you do a bit. And the story goes that uh, the captain took hold of Paul McCartney's guitar and started strumming yesterday, and Paul McCartney was singing along to that song <laughs> in the flight deck of Concord. So wind forward a couple of weeks, and uh, I was in New York with the same captain, and we were getting ready to, to fly back to the UK, and Ron said, uh, oh, John, I, he looked through the passenger list and said, oh, my mate Paul's getting on tonight. Do you mind if I go up to the lounge and say hello? I said, no, that's fine, I'll, I'll get everything set up. Uh, you, you go and do that. And so he came back and off we went, dead on time. And there we were in the cruise at uh, twice the speed of sound on the edge of space, fast than speeding bullet and all that. And um, I turned around and Paul McCartney was in the galley. I thought, I've got to go and meet this gentleman. So, um, so I did. We had a lovely chat. It was really good fun. Wrote in the girls' books. And um, I said, Mr. McCartney, I hope you don't mind, but we're all dining out on that story, just like I am now. We're all dining out on that story a couple of weeks ago when you came into the flight deck with your guitar. And he said, and I can't do his accent. He said, um, yes, John. He said, uh, so am I. I think he spent some time in Birmingham. Yes, John, so am I. He said, because when I was a kid in Liverpool, I never thought I'd get the chance to play my guitar on the flight deck of Concord. 
you know, so it's a big privilege for him as well. Anyway, we met lots of smashing people uh, along the way. Um, thoroughly enjoyed the, uh, the scheduled flights uh, and the charters as well. Uh, we used to have um, a facility, I'm going to tell you a little bit about one of the Birmingham charters I did. We used to have the opportunity to take friends and family on charter flights with us, as long as we weren't landing outside the UK, because then there were customs and tickets and all sorts of problems. But we could take friends and family on the, on the flight deck of Concorde. So I was doing a charter flight one day. Uh, we were launching out of Heathrow, going supersonic up around the North Sea and landing at Birmingham, and then a refuel and a change of passengers and other 100 people getting on to go on a supersonic experience back around the North Sea and back into Birmingham. I think we were doing a couple of those. And then we all went to Pizza Express for the evening and spent the night in a hotel. We did a similar thing the next day and in and out of Manchester. So we did about six to eight flights around the UK, 100 people uh, having their Concord experience. And I was able to take uh, my girls along. We came up with this cunning plan where I would take one of my daughters out of Heathrow on the first flight and my wife Lynn would shoot up the M40 and we'd swap them over there and then take the second daughter on the, on the second flight. So, um, and the other pilots, of course, wanted to fly their kids, so we worked it all out over the weekend. It was more complicated than flying the aeroplane, making sure we got a ride. So off we went, and uh, I'll take you through uh, what goes on in the flight shortly, but when we go supersonic, we put full power and the uh, reheats on, and uh, we need that extra acceleration to get through what used to be known as the sound barrier, of course. And we put the reheats on in pairs, we do uh, the inboard ones first and then the outboard ones. And if you're a passenger sitting there with your glass of champagne, you just feel two slight nudges in your back and you'll see just a little ripple, two little ripples on your glass of champagne. And that's all that's involved in going through the sound barrier. So Jen was with me and, and she, had a, she always had a tremendous passion for aviation. She now is the Concord Operations Manager here at Brooklyn's Museum. But she's about 13, sitting in the flight deck with me. And I was actually commentating that day. I wasn't in one of the pilot seats. I was hosting all the flight deck visits and explaining what was going on. And we're now doing our preparations to go supersonic. So I clipped the microphone off uh, to the passengers and I said, Jen, we're about to go supersonic. Uh, do you want to put the reheats on? What I should have said was, in a minute when I tell you to, and two at a time. Because <laughs> instead of getting two slight nudges in the pack, those passengers got one very large nudge in their back and very soon we were supersonic. <laughs> Another very special charter flight for me, ladies and gentlemen, very close to my heart, was taking my mum and dad on Concorde. Now my dad was uh, a very quiet, introvert sort of ch uh, chap, rather like myself, and um, he didn't like crowded environments, was slightly claustrophobic, was very fussy about what he ate, and had never flown. He would never fly. And he... Um, was always, he had a tremendously technical brain, always wanted to know about Concorde. Whenever I came back, I'd sit and talk to him for hours about the aeroplane and what had gone on. And I said, Dad, you must come for a ride one day. Oh, no, 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 I, I won't do that. But he eventually did, just before his 80th birthday. He was worried about what he'd eat. I said, just bring your sandwiches, Dad, just bring your own food. <laughs> and I was chuffed to bits when I took a break from commentating again and went out into the cabin and his sandwiches were still in the Sainsbury's bag under the seat and he was getting stuck into the smoked salmon. <laughs> so uh, that was a very proud uh, day for me. So let me take you through, ladies and gentlemen, a typical flight from London to New York. And again, we do at least 16 of these under training before being let loose to, to do them routinely. So we'd start off in the crew briefing area at uh, Heathrow uh, about uh, 8.50 for a 10.30 departure. Uh, you see, there's three of us there, there's Captain Derek Woodley, that's uh, Les Evans, I think, and flight engineer Andy Chalmers, and flight planner Mike Wormsley. We're really a small personal team, and they take us through all the briefing and the, looking at the weather charts um, for the route. Now, when you're studying the weather en route for a transatlantic crossing for the 777, it's really quite significant. The highest altitude we go to would be 41,000 feet, and that's quite high for a modern airliner. What was relevant uh, in planning um, subsonic transatlantic trips is the, the jet streams. I'm sure you heard about jet streams. So if we're flying west, they tend to be headwinds, so we have to plan a route to avoid them. That could be 150 miles an hour. Um, there's areas of turbulence, so we need to know where they are, and we have to plan to avoid those. There's thunderstorms. We look at the weather charts, and we plan to avoid those. 
And also, as far as studying the weather con is concerned, it's, it's the relevant weather at the destination. Is it foggy? Is it frosty? Are, there, are it snowing? Are there crosswinds? Things like that. Now, studying the en route weather on Concorde was much less relevant. We were way above all the weather systems. We'd be up uh, somewhere between 58 and 60,000 feet. There were no jet streams, there were no thunderstorms, there was no turbulence, which is the flight, why the flight times on Concorde never varied by more than five minutes or so. There was no weather up there. Uh, we were more interested in the temperatures. I won't get too technical, but if the temperature changed, then the performance of the aeroplane was affected. And of course, we were just as uh, interested in the weather at New York as we would be on a Boeing 777. So then we choose how much fuel to, be, to put on the aeroplane, depending on the weather, the number of passengers we were carrying. And it would be typically something like 93 tonnes we'd load on Concorde for a transatlantic flight. By putting the fuel on, we were actually doubling the weight of the aeroplane. When it was sitting out there with just passengers on board and uh, some um, Louis Vuitton luggage and things like that, uh, it would weigh about 90-odd tonnes. So we were doubling the weight of the aeroplane by putting 93 tonnes of fuel on. We then go out to the aeroplane and start all our pre-flight checks about 60 minutes or so before departure. We all had specific checks to do. So the first officer, which is what I was, would be in the right-hand seat at the front, captain on the left, and the flight engineer facing sideways uh, on his uh, panel there. The flight engineer would also uh, inspect the outside of the aeroplane, oversee the refueling, which was quite a complex uh, operation on Concorde. Um, and then we'd all get together, run through our briefing, and be ready to depart on time. So, literally, uh, at dead on 10.30, we'd be ready to push back and start our engines. Now, on Concorde, there is no APU. An APU is an auxiliary power unit, which on subsonic aeroplanes is a, a small jet engine, in the, normally in the tail of the aeroplane. Uh, and it's there, you'll hear it running when you walk out to get on board an aeroplane, and it's providing electricity and uh, compressed air. We use the electricity to make sure that by the time you get on the aeroplane, the lights are at least working, uh, all the systems are powered up, and if you're sitting in first class, then the champagne is being nicely chilled. Uh, the air from the APU is used to provide the air conditioning and also used to start the engines. We used compressed air to blow the engines around to start them up. Concorde wasn't fitted with an APU. It was very weight critical, so we did away with that. And the aeroplane was, uh, as you boarded it, was plugged into various umbilical cords on the ground providing electricity and that compressed air. So we would have to start two of the engines on the gate, on the parking spot, uh, before we could disconnect from our ground supply. So we do that. We start one engine on each side of the aircraft, numbers two and three, and then disconnect all the cables and the air supply and push back off the gate and lower the visor uh, to uh, its first position so we could see out the window, basically. Uh, and dead on time, of course, always at 10.30. A lot of you have said you can set your watch by Concorde. So once we've pushed back and we've got the engine started, we start the other two engines and then we taxi out towards uh, takeoff from uh, Terminal 4, of course it was in those days. Two runways at Heathrow, you can use them in either direction. The closest uh, takeoff point was runway 27 left and we'd burn a tonne of fuel just getting out there. If we went to the other runways, it was more like 1,400 kilos, nearly a tonne and a half. So it really did guzzle the gas, this thing, as I'm sure you know. Now on the way out to takeoff, we had to get do our pre-flight checks, including getting the centre of gravity in the correct position. Now, Concorde, unlike a conventional subsonic aeroplane, isn't fitted with a tailplane. Uh, and the, so we have to get the centre of gravity exactly right uh, for takeoff. And we do that by either moving uh, the fuel aft or burning it off. So as you'll see a bit later on, there's quite a complex set of fuel tanks on Concorde, and we've got one in the tail of the aircraft. So if we need to move the centre of gravity rearwards for takeoff, we could just pump fuel backwards into the tank in the tail. If, we, if the loading of the aeroplane, the passengers and the baggage, is such that we need to move the centre of gravity forward, then we'd burn some fuel off taxiing in the tanks further forward, and then pump fuel into them to replace it. So it's quite a precise exercise. What you can see there is the centre of gravity uh, indicator. It's a shot off the flight engineer's panel. So the centre of gravity had to be at 53.5% for takeoff, which is where the white arrow is. There was a procedure if we needed to get some extra performance, some extra weight out of the aeroplane, we could do a 54% takeoff, but I won't get too detailed. The orange tags are the forward and aft limits for the centre of gravity for that particular phase of flight. Moving the centre of gravity was a very precise exercise. We had computers to help us do it. 
we had a, the, center, the knob in the, just to the right of the gauge shows you we had uh, two computers, number one and number two. And what was reassuring, if they're both packed up, the M stands for manual. So the flight engineer could just put on various fuel pumps and do it all manually if necessary. But the automatic system, once pre-programmed, was very good. So we get the centre of gravity right for takeoff. And I've already talked you through the, uh, the takeoff procedure. But departing from any of our scheduled uh, destinations, Heathrow and New York in particular, we had very precise noise abatements procedure. procedures. I'll take you through a generic one now. But the one out of New York, for example, from runway 31 left at New York, was the most precise takeoff you could ever do on any airliner. We were very noise sensitive. We didn't, we didn't um, start operations in New York till 1977. The Americans wouldn't let us come there because they were worried about the noise. So we developed this particular noise abatement procedure in New York as soon as the aircraft was airborne. We do this stonking left-hand turn out over the bay. We cut the, po the power and the reheats as we got to the first build-up area, and then put the power back on to climb out over the next bit of water and take it off again. It was a real, real precise exercise. And we had to practice it over and over again in the simulator before we could do it on the real airplane. So a generic one is that we start, remember, three, two, one now, accelerate down the runway, and in seconds we'd be at uh, airborne and climbing away at 250 knots, some 280 miles an hour. We'd raise the nose to stop the aircraft accelerating further and climb away at that speed. Now, at a predetermined time, all right, that's why we started our stopwatches, and that time would vary depending on the weight of the aeroplane and the ambient temperature. The flight engineer would call out three, two, one, noise, and he'd reach forward and he'd switch off all the reheats and bring the power back dramatically to a pre-calculated TLA. TLA is a very technical term. It means thrust lever angle. There's literally numbers down the side of the, uh, the throttle quadrant and you just move it back to a pre-calculated number. We would actually warn the passengers about this because you've had this phenomenal acceleration just a few seconds earlier that I described to you, that push in the back, the acceleration, getting airborne, the nose coming up, and then all of a sudden, literally just a few seconds after you're airborne, it goes really quiet and it feels like you're sinking. Uh, that's a horrible feeling if you're not expecting it. In actual fact, you've just got this tremendous rate of climb that's backing off to a gentle rate of climb down to about 500 feet a minute or so. And then we'd uh, just climb out really gently, which is why if you live locally in those days and we'd taken off on the, uh, towards the east, you would see Concord coming round over Walton, over Weybridge, over Brooklands, uh, quite, uh, climbing quite slowly and making not much noise at all, believe me, even though it did sound noisy. That was a real minimum power to keep the noise away. And gradually as we got higher and higher, we would uh, feed the power back, back in as the noise became less relevant. So my favourite was taking off from the east at Heathrow and then a big right-hand turn all the way around, uh, literally over Wharton, Weybridge, out over church. Yeah, I used to be able to get both my girls' schools during morning break, much to their embarrassment. And um, in fact, one Mother's Day, I did actually manage to vary the flight path very slightly to get over Mum's house on the morning of uh, Mother's Day in Sunbury there. But very precise uh, exercise, feeding the power back in slightly, getting up to 40, 460 miles an hour, and then we'd level off at 26,000 feet initially, Mach 0.95. That's 95% of the speed of sound, so already significantly faster than a Boeing 777 cruises at. We'd maintain that height and that speed for about six minutes or so uh, as we headed off down to our acceleration point in the Bristol Channel. You probably knew that Concorde wasn't allowed to fly supersonic over land. We could only do it over the water because of the effects of the sonic boom. And we could only make that noise over the ocean. So we fly, it only took us about six minutes of subsonic cruise to get down to our acceleration point in the Bristol Channel. We get clearance from air traffic control to, they like used to call it, climb into the block. Uh, in a 777, we climb up to 35, 37,000 feet initially and a precise altitude. In Concorde, there's nobody else up there. Once we're above 41,000 feet, we had free airspace, so they let us just cruise climb. we just leave the power on. The aircraft would go up and down as necessary as the temperature changed and the weight changed. And the only other airplane up there was the other Concorde coming back the other way. But we had uh, predetermined routes that kept us well apart, of course. We get to that acceleration point in the Bristol Channel, and there's the TLAs, the actual numbers on the side of the throttle quadrant, you can see there, out of interest. But then we're ready to go, supersonic. So we put full power 
and those reheats go back on. Remember two at a time next time, Jen, and the aeroplane goes charging through the sound barrier. So we've only been airborne about uh, 16 minutes or so, and here we are, the reheat's on, we're accelerating now through Mach 1, and this was the clever bit. The, the passengers back there, all they would notice was just a slight um, ripple on their champagne, of the nudges in their back, it really wasn't exciting at all. In fact, I remember doing a charter flight, and somebody actually complained. They'd come on this charter flight thinking that the experience of going supersonic was going to be like a roller coaster ride, and he was quite disappointed. We said, that's the clever bit, sir. That's what it's all about. That's what it's all about. So gently through the sound barrier, the reheats stay on, till we get to about Mach 1.7. By then, we'd be passing 43,000 feet. Now, when we've got the reheats on, as I'm sure you can imagine, burning a hell of a lot of fuel. We literally double the fuel flow on each of those Rolls-Royce Olympus engines with reheat. So we can't keep them on for long. But we need that extra acceleration to get through the extra drag associated with transonic uh, flight. By the time we get to Mach 1.7, we can turn the reheats off. And then, you notice I still speak in the present tense, actually. I've just realized they're doing that. So we turn the reheats off, and then Concorde can do what no other aeroplane could or can do and that's to carry on accelerating without the use of reheat up to our maximum cruising speed of twice the speed of sound. So two and a half times the speed of a 777 or any other subsonic airliner. We pass through 50,000 feet at around about Mach 2 and head on up to um, 58 to 60,000 feet as the aeroplane got lighter. So the centre of gravity cruising at Mach 0.95, cruising at subsonic speeds would be We'll be there around about 55% or so, as indicated by that white needle that you saw earlier on, and the orange uh, markers showing the, the limits for uh, that particular stage of flight. And then by the time we get to Mach 2, uh, we have to move the center of gravity rearwards. Now, without getting too technical, once we're flying supersonic, the, the center of lift, the point about on the airplane, the point about which the, all the lift is said to act, moves rearwards as the shock waves change around the aeroplane, the centre of lift moves rearward. So it's rather like balancing a pencil on your finger to keep the aeroplane level, to keep it flying straight, to keep that pencil balanced on your finger, we've got to move the centre of gravity rearwards. So we do that by pumping fuel backwards. And, and that's a, a particularly uh, important task that the flight engineer has to do as we go supersonic. So you'll see that in supersonic flight, we end up with our centre of gravity way back there at something like 59%, and there's a much smaller range uh, available to us in supersonic flight. And when we come down, when we slow down again at the end of the transatlantic crossing, we move it all back again. So it's not fuel that we're moving to the back of the aeroplane that was lost forever. We can move it forward again when we become subsonic. So we can see that here. Here's a picture of the, the layout of the fuel tanks on Concorde. Now, when I turned up to do my ground school at Filton all those years ago, I knew it was going to be a tough course, but I nearly walked out the day they said, Concorde's got 13 fuel tanks, and they're numbered 1 to 11. <laughs> uh, there's a 5A and there's a 7A on the wingtips there. Incidentally, the red ones are the ones that they modified after the accident in France, which we'll talk about later on. So tank 11 was the one that we'd pump fuel backwards before um, uh, when, we, you know, when we needed to move the centre of gravity rearwards. And then when we burnt off fuel at the end of the flight and we're slowing down to become subsonic again, we've got a tonne and a half or so of fuel in 11 and we bring it back forwards again uh, and we've got it available for our subsonic flight. So you remember that I said we turn the reheats off at Mach 1.7 and Concorde could do what no other aeroplane could, which is to accelerate without the use of reheat. And that was partly because we, the incredible design of the engine intakes. The Rolls-Royce Olympus engine it just takes up quite a small part in the front of the engine, in, inside the engine housings out there. The engine intakes are the clever bit in front. Now the engine could only accept air at about half the speed of sound, about 370 miles an hour or so. So as we accelerated, as we got faster and faster, the shape of the intakes changed. Uh, and here's a picture of the intakes uh, viewed from the outside. And you can see that at the top of them, there's these doors or ramps as we called them. So as we accelerated uh, from about Mach 1.3, they changed to that sort of position. They'd come down. And again, 
These were controlled by the first ever digital computers to be used in aviation. We take it for granted nowadays, mobile phones, computers, they're everywhere, but these were the first digital computers in aviation and they were used to control the intakes on the Concorde engine ramps. Reassuringly, there were two of them and there was also a switch with an M on it as well uh, for the flight engineer uh, to move them up or down. It was a very crucial operation and they had to be in the precise position to create a supersonic shock wave in the front of the intakes. And what that would do is to slow the air down from Mach 2 to about half the speed of sound in a very short distance. And it was working like a, so it was compressing the air, it was working like a supercharger and pushing the air into the engines. And that was costing us nothing, of course. There was no fuel burn associated with that. So this was a really clever piece of kit. So we were getting an extra 25% of thrust just from these intakes. So that was replacing the thrust we got from the reheats earlier on. Now you'd probably know the Russians had a go at building a supersonic aeroplane. Um, this flew, it flew before Concorde, but it was never a success. And one of the reasons that never worked properly was they never got the intakes right. Despite trying to nick our plans, they never got the intakes right. So their Concorde ski, as we called it, could only ever fly with the reheats on all the time. And obviously that affected the range of the airplane uh, drastically. I think all it ever did was fly mail across the Soviet Union. So there we are. Um, that's how we control the, uh, the thrust. We settle down in our cruise. There's our office window. We literally could see outside. The sky was black if you looked up. You could see the curvature of the earth. Yeah, and we had time to enjoy leftovers of f any fine lunch. In fact, it was a bad day at work if by 45 minutes into the flight we hadn't had three mugs of tea with leftover caviar. <laughs> Certainly got an, an acquired a taste for that. So that was our view out of our office window. The autopilot would be engaged. Uh, you can see there on the right hand side our maximum altitude set in the altitude select window of 60,000 feet. The auto thrust is engaged and we literally leave full power on as the aircraft gets lighter it just drifts on up towards 60,000 feet which is our maximum altitude. The aeroplane got hot in flight. Um, there's a lot of friction when you're flying supersonic so just to digress very slightly, what is, what is supersonic flight? Well if you're flying subsonically you're flying slower than the speed of sound. What is the speed of sound? Well, it varies with temperature. Uh, at sea level, it's about 760 miles an hour, uh, and at uh, the altitudes we were flying at, it's about 650 miles an hour. There's a formula for it. It's 38.84 times the square root of the temperature absolute. I'll be asking the questions afterwards, so make sure you've got that. And if you want to know more about that, it's in Chris's book over here, which I'm going to be trying to sell to you later on. Chris Orlebar writes a tremendous lot uh, about Concorde, and that formula is in that book. So there we are. Um, so Concorde gets very hot. And that, so travelling at less than the speed of sound, uh, I'm, I'm talking to you now, in case you hadn't noticed, I'm moving the molecules in the air, they're vibrating and rattling about, and they're reaching your ears. And that vibration is travelling through the air at about 760 miles an hour. It's a bit like a boat going up the river. You can see the bow wave forming in front of the boat. The water knows the boat is coming, just like the air knows that an aeroplane is, is coming uh, and it moves out of the way to let the air through. Now, as the aeroplane approaches the speed of sound, the molecules don't get any advance notice. They don't get the opportunity to move out of the way. And that's why in the early days they came across what they called the sound barrier. They literally had to fight their way through the sound barrier. So by the time the molecules haven't got a chance to get out of the way, it's a bit like a speedboat getting up onto the plane, you put the extra power on to go supersonic, get it up out on the plane and then you don't need so much power and it'll stay there. That's kind of a two-dimensional uh, similar thing. So once we are punching through the air with the molecules getting no advance notice, there's a lot of friction. We're now forcing the air apart. And because of that friction, the aeroplane got very hot. The temperature on the front of the aeroplane would reach 127 degrees centigrade and it's minus 60 outside. Our limit, our TMO as we called it, was 128 degrees centigrade. If it ever got to that or higher than that for more than a few seconds we'd have to slow down or the aeroplane would start to melt. So 127, sorry, 127 degrees on the nose, slightly cooler but still very warm as you moved backwards along the aeroplane. In my seat, I could put my hand up on the metal frame against the window and it's almost too hot to touch. 
If you go on Delta Gulf and have, look, have a look around, they've stripped out the area around the passenger windows. And you can see the, 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 the pipes for the cooling air that had to pass around the windows so the passengers didn't burn their hands on the windows. Tremendously hot. Things get hot, they grow. And probably some of you probably know that Concorde actually used to grow about eight inches in flight. No, you didn't get extra leg room when you were supersonic. The seats were effectively fitted on a tray within the airframe, but the whole aircraft expanded by about eight inches. And then as we slow down into subsonic flight, it would shrink back again. This is incredible, incredible technology, ladies and gentlemen, and it would do it twice a day for 27 years and never broke. As the aeroplane grew, the best place to see it was in the flight deck. The flight engineer's panel was up against a, a bulkhead which was alongside him. And in uh, subsonic flight or on the ground, that bulkhead was flush up against the engineer's panel. Cruising at twice the speed of sound, the aeroplane had grown so much you could put your fist in the gap sideways. And if you go and see Concorde in many of the museums now around the world, you'll see a flight engineer's hat squashed in that gap. He put his hat in there on many of the flights uh, in the supersonic cruise, knowing that it, nobody would ever steal it in the museum because it's crushed in that gap that closed up again. So there we are, flying very fast in a very hot aeroplane across the Atlantic. And uh, less than three hours after takeoff, we've reached our deceleration point on the other side of the Atlantic. We'd always approach New York uh, from the south so we could maximize our, maximize our time over the ocean and hence our time flying supersonically. When I go there in the 777, we come down from the north over land. Now flying uh, the deceleration was a very precise procedure as well. We used to call it re-entry rather like the space shuttle. If you just close the throttles, uh, as we would, would do on a 777, it would be like flying into a brick wall. Your nose would be on the front of the cabin. So we had to reduce the power gently. The flight engineer would do this, gently lean forward, reduce the power, we'd decelerate slowly, then we'd start a gentle descent. And by, as we pass back through about 35,000 feet, we go back through the sound barrier and become a subsonic aeroplane again. And incredibly, just be able to slot in with the Boeing 747s and other subsonic airliners arriving into Kennedy. Uh, absolutely incredible. And there we are just over three hours after leaving Heathrow, touching down at New York. So by comparison, let me just show you some figures about flying to, uh, across the ocean to New York. Concorde versus the Boeing 777. So typical flight time on Concorde from London to New York, around about three hours and 20 minutes. I did it not that long ago. It seems to go on forever at seven hours and 50 minutes once you've experienced Concorde. We burn a lot of fuel on Concorde, of course you would. We'd, we wouldn't burn it all, but we'd load about 93 tonnes. On the 777, we'd do the trip having loaded 58 tonnes, so you know, nearly half the fuel. On Concorde, we carry 100 passengers. All uh, one class, uh, it was Concorde class, it was better than anything else you could fly. On the 777, we take 270. I understand some of them sit in a place called economy class, but I haven't been there. Um, now, the record transatlantic crossing, and there was a big billboard up in New York for many years promoting this as part of our Concorde advertising campaign in New York, was an incredible feat set on the 7th of February 1996 uh, by our colleague Captain Les Scott from New York to London. All the weather conditions were right, Air traffic control were geared up to give them a no delay arrival into Heathrow and they did it an incredible two hours, 52 minutes and 59 seconds. Nobody will ever beat that. We all tried but nobody will ever, ever beat that. Concorde was so fast crossing the Atlantic, uh, westbound was very slightly slower but not, not uh, that much so. That, for example, in the, uh, we did two flights a day, there was the 10.31 in the morning and the 7.30 departure out of Heathrow on the BA003, and in the spring and the autumn, we'd leave Heathrow at 7.30 in the evening, it would be dark. And as we flew to New towards New York, we were flying faster than the Earth was rotating, so we'd see the sunrise in the west. No other human being apart from Tim Peake will ever see that again. And we'd land in New York in time to see the second sunset of the day. So in Concorde, we had a fleet of seven aircraft, on the 777, we've got 58 at our last count. I think they've stopped arriving now. So we've got a vast fleet on the 777. We only have ever had about 30 pilots on the Concorde fleet at, uh, at any one time. Um, and as I touched on earlier on, there were only ever, in the 27 years of operation, 134 pilots that flew Concorde and uh, 57. So they're even rarer, 57 flight engineers. 
over the 27-year period. On the 777, we've got 1,224 pilots flying for British Airways today, let alone all those that flew it last year and the year before and those to fly it in the future. So it really is um, you know, a vast difference. The 777 route structure is, of course, global. The shortest flight we do is, is down to Tel Aviv, uh, and the longest one we do is, is Sydney. Not non-stop, of course, we stop in Singapore. But it's a global route structure. We normally have just two crew on the, uh, as a, on the Boeing 777, but we're controlled by, our, um, by laws to the number of hours we can work. So on longer pli flights, anything more than about eight and a half hours or so, we'd have three pilots. And uh, we've got some fairly glamorous uh, overhead crew rest areas above the passenger cabins. We've got bunk beds up there and seats, and we can watch movies or have a sleep. So uh, it's vital, of course, that we're fully rested for the landing the other end. And on what we call ultra long haul flights, we'd actually have four pilots. Uh, currently we have four on trips to Buenos Aires and uh, Singapore. Uh, something like 14 hours, it's far too long. I, I try and avoid those. Um, 14 hours or so in the air. Now one quick trip I'll tell you about on the 777 was I had the privilege to do a delivery flight. Uh, I was uh, invited to go to uh, the Boeing factory to pick up a brand new 777. I don't know if any of you have had the privilege of collecting a brand new car, but it's that and some. We were treated like VIPs. We had a fine lunch. We were given a tour of the Boeing factory. And when we went on board the, uh, the aeroplane, it really had that new aeroplane, just like you get the, the new car smell to it. There wasn't, wasn't coffee stains and sweet wrappers all over the flight deck, as there is when I go to work next week. It really was absolutely pristine. We were given the red carpet treatment. There was cutting of ribbons and various ceremonies as we went on board this brand new aeroplane. I was given a, a copy of the receipt. I didn't pay for it, British Airways paid for it, but I've got a copy of the receipt somewhere just for posterity. When we bought the aeroplane from Boeing, uh, it didn't come with seats on. It came with an empty cabin like that, and we fitted our own seats uh, in all the cabins throughout the aeroplane. It did come fitted with some basic galley equipment, um, some ovens and uh, fridges, I think, but no what we call bev makers, no facilities for making tea or coffee. So it's sp slightly sparsely fitted. So um, for the trip back, we were given boxes of sandwiches and some hot meals. We could eat those, uh, but no, no tea or coffee, uh, no uh, facilities. We had tea and coffee in flasks, but no facilities. And um, there were three of us on the flight, as you just saw on the trip. And there was a bit of, I could see what sense what was going on. This aeroplane on this special flight is going to do one takeoff and one landing, and there were three of us. So uh, we're all very you know, gentlemen, uh, and having flown Concorde, I wasn't that bothered. So I said, guys, you, you, you fill your boots. You, you sort that out amongst yourselves. I'll be the extra guy. I'll sit in the jump seat for takeoff and landing and keep an eye on everything, and, and I'll take care of the galley and, and bring you tea and coffee and sandwiches and whatever you want. So we were taxiing out for, for takeoff, and uh, so I, my only responsibility was to secure the galley, make sure everything was tidied and uh, put away safely. And then I went back in and strapped myself into the third seat for, for takeoff. Uh, and off we launched. We owned this aeroplane about two and a half hours. We'd been airborne for about five seconds. And I heard all this clattering and banging from behind me. The captain looked round and said, don't worry, I'll check that out. And I went back into the galley as soon as it was safe to leave my seat. And that flask you can just see on the left-hand side of that picture which is fairly obvious, but being a typical bloke, I hadn't seen it. I'd left it there for takeoff, and as I went outside, there was about three gallons of black coffee smashed all over the floor of this brand new aeroplane. I was rather embarrassed, and I thought it actually might be a career-limiting move, but I was very relieved when we arrived in Cardiff, which is where we were taking the aeroplane, that the engineers said, don't worry about that, John, we're going to rip all this lot out, and it all goes in the skip, and we fit our own equipment from now on anyway. So. Um, that was a relief, but uh, rather embarrassing at the time. <laughs> anyway, back to Concorde. Um, British Airways flew uh, something like uh, two and a half million people at twice the speed of sound on Concorde. On those scheduled services I've spoken about, we went twice a day to New York, we went once a week to Barbados, and we did those numerous charter flights that I've referred to. We started it on the 21st of January, 1976, and we were still going strong on the 25th of July, 2000, some 24 years without significant incidents. When suddenly the unthinkable happened. It was a Tuesday afternoon. 
on 25th of July 2000 and an Air France charter flight was taking off from Paris Charles de Gaulle. 130 people, 113 people died in the accident as the aircraft crashed just a minute after takeoff to the west of the airfield. I'm sure we can all remember where we were that day. The accident was caused by this very piece of metal. It had fallen off uh, a thrust reverser uh, as part of a repair of a Continental Airlines DC-10 that had taken off just a few minutes before Concorde. Concorde took off. I told you earlier on about the fact there's no lift, that all the weight is on those wheels and the tyre was punctured because of that very high speed the tyre was rotating at, the very high pressure of the tyres and the best part of 200 tonnes on, on those tyres, no lift reducing the weight. The tyre burst, it broke into very large pieces, weighing up to four kilograms, and they were slung in every direction. One of those pieces hit the underside of the wing with tremendous force. You've seen the layout of the fuel tanks on the wing. It didn't burst the tank at that stage. The tanks were jammed full with fuel. It hit the underside of the rear part of one of the tanks, and as the airplane was accelerating, all the fuel was pushed to the rear of that tank. So it set up a shock wave of fuel inside that tank. It had nowhere to go, so the fuel surged forward again, and then it burst out of the front of the tank. The tank ruptured. There was a massive fuel leak. The tyre had also damaged some wiring around the undercarriage. There was wiring there to power the brake cooling fans. The wheels got hot, they, needed, they had fans built into them, they were electrically driven, and the power supply to those fans was through electric cables which were shattered by the damage from the tyre. That caused the spark. Initially, they thought it might have been the reheat that caused the fire, but it wasn't. It was the sparks from the wiring that set light to the aeroplane, or the fuel coming out of the aeroplane. There was an uncontrollable fire. Also because of damage, they were unable to raise the undercarriage, so they had a lot of extra drag to deal with, with the undercarriage being jammed down. The fire was actually outside of the engines, but it triggered the fire warning systems on the engines. The engines were now sucking in hot air. The airflow was disturbed, so they had what we call engine surges, like backfires uh, uh, on a car. The number two engine started to shut, suffer first, and the flight engineers shut that down just as they were airborne. Um, they only ever reached 200 feet and got to a speed of 200 knots, far below, far below the minimum speed for flying the aeroplane safely on two engines. They needed about another 100 knots or so. There was no chance of recovery. BA cancelled uh, the flight that evening. The BA 003 to New York was cancelled as a mark of respect. The board meeting was uh, convened and a hell of a decision was made. The aeroplane had been flying for 24 years, so we took the difficult but I believe sensible decision to resume Concorde services. I flew the next morning to New York. It was a very sombre experience, but we had to get the show back on the road. The investigation, of course, got under underway, and the facts I've just taken you through uh, soon became apparent. They weren't obvious to start with. And at 10 a.m. on the 15th of August 2000, so uh, just less than a month after the accident, the Civil Aviation Authority phoned British Airways at 10 o'clock, 30 minutes before our BA001 was due to depart for New York. I was on that flight. They gave us 24 hours notice that the following day we were going to be withdrawing, they were going to be withdrawing the certificate of airworthiness. It's like your MOT certificate on a car. On a car. They were giving us 24 hours notice that the aeroplane was going to be grounded. Why the 24 hours notice, they asked, and that was because, well, you've got aeroplanes in New York, you've got aeroplanes at other places, get them back home and park them up. So they gave us 24 hours notice. Now, quite rightly, the Board of British Airways decided, well, look, if we know that tomorrow the aeroplane is going to be deemed unsafe to fly, how can we possibly let the BA001 depart this morning? So we had just pushed back from the gate. We just started the engines. Uh, again, I was the safety pilot, the fourth guy on that particular flight. We were called back to the gate. Air traffic control just gave us a, a message, said, return to the gate. We knew there was nothing wrong with the aeroplane, and because everybody's listening to the uh, air traffic control radios, you never go into details about the reasons behind these sort of things. They just said, Speedbird 1, return to the gate. 
we looked at one another and tried to figure out what the reason was. We thought perhaps it was a bomb threat and we returned back onto the stand. I was the first one to open the door and our dispatcher, our lady arrived to put the jetty on the side of the aeroplane and uh, she said, what are you guys doing back? And I said, I thought you were going to tell us that. And then the penny dropped. We all realised what had happened. There were two passengers that I remember on that particular flight. One was Queen Noor of Jordan, so I found myself taking care of her, getting her handed over to the special services people to get her um, off to the sidelines and taken good care of. We knew it wouldn't be long before there'd be a media frenzy. And there was an old lady from France who was travelling. Uh, she lived in the south of France somewhere. She was travelling as part of a tour group to tour the United States. The rest of her group had flown subsonically from France. She wanted to fly on Concorde, so she'd made her own way to Heathrow to fly on Concorde and meet up with the rest of the party in New York. That poor lady never got her Concorde flight. That was the last time I was ever on Concorde. That was the end of my Concorde career. I never had any warning that it was coming. I never went back on another British Airways Concorde. But the fleet was grounded, but uh, there was a tremendously uh, positive attitude. Uh, we were all put on gardening leave, sat at home for three months or so. The garden had never looked better. Um, but it became apparent the aeroplane was going to be sitting around for quite a while. So quite rightly, we were all offered uh, or encouraged to go and fly other aeroplanes. I was offered a job as a captain on the Airbus fleet, and very soon a training captain. And the deal was that when Concorde went back into the air, we could all come back. So we weren't burning our bridges at that stage. But quite sensibly, we had to go off and do other jobs. The accident was, the accident was caused by a freak chain of events. Uh, the, you know, that chain must be broken. We've spoken about the, 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 the puncture. So one way of breaking that chain was to modify the tyres to make sure that if it ever punctured again, it would only break into small pieces and not the large chunks. The fuel leak, well, we could put armour plating inside the fuel tanks to stop that, uh, to stop the, the massive fuel leak if it ever happened again. And we could armour plate the wiring to make sure that if ever that got damaged, we wouldn't get the sparks we had before. And we also developed um, crew procedures. We put a, basically a new switch in so that we would disable the brake cooling fans before every takeoff, so there was no live electrics on the wheels. So British Airways and Air France and the uh, manufacturers put in a program to cover all three. Any one would have done it, but we said, no, we're going to do this properly. Regardless of cost, we will do all three. Michelin initially said it would take a long time to develop a new tyre that could cope with that strain, and, and yet, if it did have a puncture, it would only break into small pieces. They did it in six months, which was absolutely incredible. The um, modification programme got underway, and if this video works, it'll show you a little bit of what was involved in the fuel tanks. One of the objectives of the modifications is to actually prevent that huge big gashing out of fuel should there be another fuel tank rupture or puncture in the future. That's the objective of this particular component of the modification. These are called fuel tank liners. Its construction is basically Kevlar. The black substance you see on it is a rubber compound that we use on Concord. It's a compound called Viton sealant. Basically it has really good heat resistance capabilities. So the combination of these two results in a really strong but very flexible component for lining the fuel tanks. It is used currently in Formula One racing cars and also in military helicopters for lining fuel tanks to prevent huge big rupturings in the event of a missile hit or something similar. It's installed partly using some of the existing structure but also introducing around about 4,000 additional attachment brackets to hold it in place. And that's the basic installation. As you can see, the liner is suitably molded to suit the internal uh, parts of the fuel tank. I actually have in my hand a sample of the old wiring loom, which as you can see was a, a bunch of wires contained within a thin aluminium tube. Now the theory is that a piece of the tire or a piece of the hard metal that is contained within the landing gear may have come up, struck this piece of wiring, severed it and so induced an actual live spark that could have ignited the actual fuel and so resulting in the flame. What the manufacturers have actually designed to take care of that problem is a new type of uh, wiring loom which first of all contains a small amount of PTFE tape or Teflon tape as we most commonly know it to further insulate the wires and in addition to that they've wrapped that in a, in a very strong and tough stainless steel flexible braiding which then will take care of one of the potential ignition sources and Alpha Fox, the aircraft that we're standing next to has actually had that modification embodied. So with apologies for the audio quality there ladies and gentlemen, of course it worked perfectly in rehearsal um, I hope you got the gist of that. That was the Kevlar uh, fuel linings that went into the, uh, the fuel tanks 
and uh, Claude there was talking about the armour plating that was going around the, uh, the wiring. Concorde was effectively a man-made aeroplane. No two fuel tanks were the same, so every uh, lining had to be actually handmade specifically for one, each individual location. It was a hell of a challenge, and it was very difficult to get in, into those fuel tanks. They chose the smallest engineers to do the fitting. So we had seven aeroplanes and we upgraded just five of them to get back into service to see how business was going to recover. We knew we had to get Concorde flying within about a year. If we dragged on to two years, we would have lost the market. It wasn't going to happen. So there was a tremendous team that got involved. The enthusiasm, the passion, the determination to get this aeroplane back in the sky again was never in doubt. We were so confident that the aeroplane was going to come back into service and fly for another 10 years or so or more that we actually modified all the interiors. We spent two million odd pounds on each aeroplane, putting new seats in, putting new toilets in. It was ready for the next generation of supersonic flight. We went through a tremendous return to service program, as well as doing the technical modifications. The CAA were working with us throughout the program uh, and everything had to, be uh, had to be approved. And we did several proving flights. Uh, the first one I think was on the 17th of July in 2000. I remember being at the girls sports day and watching Concord come over the top. That was a tear in my eye to see Concord back in the air for the first time since the accident. Absolutely tremendous. And they did actually um, uh, carry on with these proving flights and 13 months after being grounded, they were doing the final proving flight on 11th of September 2001. The aeroplane was in the air, working perfectly, going absolutely fine. Halfway across the Atlantic was the plan to come back again and that date rings a bell in your minds, I suspect, because it was when this happened. I'm sure we all remember where we were that day. Concord was in the air on its final proving flight. And we knew then that um, that was going to have a drastic effect uh, on our Concord operation. Businesses around the world, as I'm sure we will remember, absolutely collapsed overnight. Um, aviation in particular was very, very badly hit. In British Airways, we lost on all our premium traffic, our first class and business class passengers just stopped flying. People could not afford to fly. People were scared of flying as well. We were losing in British Airways two million pounds a day at one stage. Uh, the air airlines, national airlines collapsed. Sabina and uh, Swiss Air, the national carriers, just ran out of money. Aviation was really badly hit. Our premium passenger traffic, as I said, disappeared overnight. We did, carry, we did decide to go back into service. We had a tremendously warm welcome when we went back into New York and resumed Concord commercial services. And literally just nine, on the 9th of November 2001, we um, arrived back in New York. Initially, we had encouraging passenger loads. The novelty was there. The business was coming back. But then passenger loads dropped off. I remember ringing up one day to find out how many people were on the 003 that night going to New York. There were three passengers on board. It was unsustainable. I, I wasn't involved, but I remember the uh, managing, management and our marketing team had our regular passengers to, for lunch at Heathrow. Because 80% of the passengers on Concorde were senior business, businesses, business executives, the presidents of companies. And um, so our, our traffic was based on those businessmen, not so much the celebrities I touched on earlier on. And we said, when, can we, when are you going to come back and fly with us? And the expression I was quoted was something along the lines of, we cannot foresee the day when we can be seen to be including Concorde in our corporate travel plans. The business wasn't going to come back. So on Thursday, the 10th of April 2003, British Airways and Air France made simultaneous announcements announcing that Concorde would be grounded. We started together. The program goes back to the 1950s. You know, uh, and, and the aeroplane first flew in 1969. We worked jointly with the French. We launched together, as I've said, on the 21st of January, uh, 1976. And the agreement was we would finish together, the Concorde Agreement. So because of the cost of uh, spares, uh, maintenance, and the fact that the traffic, the business just wasn't there, they made that dreadful decision to stop. Gave six months notice. And of course, once it was in the media, every flight was full. All those people that were dreamed of flying Concorde, they, felt that they, they got that money and they fulfill, fulfill that lifelong ambition to fly on the aeroplane. Uh, as we approached the end of that six months, I was really, really hoping somebody would stand up and say, only kidding, 
but they didn't. That was the end of Concord. There was a grand finale on the 24th of October, 2003. I couldn't bear to be there. I was in a beach bar in Barbados, my second happiest place. There were three flights that landed within five minutes of one another. There was a, a charter flight from Edinburgh, one of our round the bay charter flights, as we call it, where people did that 90 minute flight, supersonic round the bay of Biscay, that landed. And then at 16.05, five past four that afternoon, the last ever commercial flight from New York with Captain Mike Bannister, regular here at Brooklyn's Museum, landed at Backett Heathrow. And that was the end of supersonic travel on a commercial basis. A lump in the throat whenever I think about it. Ladies and gentlemen, there's been a wonderful team of people involved in Concord throughout those 40 plus years, taking it back into the design and development stage. There's been thousands of people. I've met people here tonight who talked about their relatives who worked at Filton. Um, there's been designers, there's been engineers, there's been mechanics, ground staff, cabin crew, managers, politicians, pilots, and as I said earlier on, even rarer the flight engineers. But what's so wonderful, ladies and gentlemen, again, to be here at Brooklyn's, is that there's people out there keeping Concord alive for the next generations. We've got a tremendous team of volunteers here at Brooklyn's. And without them, Concord wouldn't be available to the masses that come here every day to experience Concord, the Concord experience. So a big thank you. I know some of you are in the room tonight. The work you do is absolutely fantastic. So people of all ages and all generations come here to Brooklyn's to enjoy Concord, keeping that dream alive. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you for spending the time with me this evening. I'm going to leave you with a shot of the last ever landing. And I hope you agree with me now that the greatest icon of the 20th century was Concord. Am I still alive? Yes. Yeah. Uh, the gentleman here asked, were there any females on the training course? Yeah, that's, that's a really good question. There were. We had one lady Concorde pilot within uh, British Airways. Her name was Barbara Harmer. She was an absolute legend. Um, I had the pleasure to meet and fly with her. She was the only one. She's sadly no longer with us. But Barbara started life as a hairdresser. Uh, and she joined uh, a flying club, rather like me. She had a passion for, for aviation. She joined a flying club, I think it was at Shoreham, but I might be wrong on that. Goodwood, was it? Somebody knows more about Barbara. But, but yeah, she joined a flying club at Goodwood, and then she got her pilot's license and joined British Caledonian. And when British Caledonian merged with British Airways, here she was on the British Airways payroll and the British Airways pilot's uniform, and she did what I did. She bid and she applied to join Concorde, and she was an absolute legend. Absolute legend, Barbara. Thank you. Another question. Yes, sir, just hang on we get the microphone. Uh, John, uh, you talk about, uh, I talk about this aircraft on some occasion, and uh, I tell the one or two things, and I thought I came here this evening to see if you could update me and so forth, and you obviously did. Um, but we, John, uh, my answer talks about 30 degrees attitude, because I was told this, this aircraft has an attitude, and you talk about 10 and a half, it, which is the, uh, the operative. Okay, the, the 13 degrees attitude is probably referring to takeoff. After takeoff, we'd pitch up to about 13 degrees. Uh, coming into land, the aircraft's that much lighter, um, so we don't need quite so much lift. So it would be a 10 and a half degrees typical nose attitude, nose up attitude on the approach. Yeah, very, very, almost flat. Yeah, something like two degrees, almost flat, really streamlined. 
And the whole point of getting the centre of gravity right, there's, there's no elevons sticking out in the breeze, uh, everything's streamlined, but about two degrees. There is it. The, absolutely, yes. So the, the other ones we want to keep as, keep as streamlined as possible because you start sticking those out in the breeze at that speed and you get a lot of drag and it slows you down. So if we, have a, if we need to turn, um, then yes, we would still you have to use the elevons just that you wouldn't even see them move. The deflection would be so small. And the point was that we would move the fuel to control the centre of gravity to stop the elevons uh, going up or down to control the pitch of the aeroplane. Yeah, 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 that's true. But the, the main thing is we want to keep the aeroplane streamlined, otherwise we'd, we'd just be too much drag. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much indeed. Now we've got one additional thing. Toulouse. Concorde 001 made her most important public appearance back end first. She was being nosed out of her hangar by a tractor on the day for which Britain and France and the rest of the world had waited so long. The great, giant, supersonic jetliner was going to fly. A year late, millions of pounds over the estimated cost, and still a very big question mark. These were Concorde's first claims to fame. But on this day, a lot of those question marks would be answered. For Concorde 001, this was the chance to prove she was the super bird everyone had hoped and worked for. A hundred and ninety-three feet long, thirty-eight feet tall, with a wingspan of eighty-four feet. Vital statistics of an Anglo-French lady who was all dressed up and ready to go places on the biggest date of her life. Keeping that date were the world's press. All eyes were glued to the sleek, futuristic machine standing on its spindly legs out there. Its droop snoot in the down position surveying the sea. At the other end, heat surged from the mighty Rolls-Royce engines as the ground crew checked, rechecked and checked again. Concorde was buttoned up good and tight. There was little more anyone could do other than fly her. After six years of designing and building, delays and progress, the dream was a reality. Concorde nosed slowly out towards the starting point of her flying career. The men chosen to crew the Speedbird on her maiden flight had plenty to do during the last few seconds before takeoff. The all-important final pre-flight check carried out by Chief Pilot Andre Tuka and his crew went without a hitch. This was it. Tons of test equipment on board, Andre Turka took Concorde up to 10,000 feet. She was almost ticking over at less than 300 miles an hour. Nose still in the group position, undercarriage down. The less for the pilot to do, the better. Earthbound technicians waited for reports to come in. And what reports they were. Concorde handled beautifully. After only 27 minutes of flight, she was coming home. The weather was threatening, but the test pilot knew what he wanted to know. Concorde was coming back as a success.
In a few years' time, the sight of Concords on international airfields all over the world will be commonplace if all goes well. Then there'll be 130 passengers on board. Flying times will have been cut by half. London to New York from 7 hours 40 minutes to 3 hours 25 minutes. But for the moment, there's a lot more flight testing to be done. A long, lonely job for the French and British test pilots and their crew. But now was a time of triumph, and André Tourcard was the hero. Jubilant senior executives of Sud Aviation and the British Aircraft Corporation greeted the tall, quiet Frenchman who had taken their machine on its successful maiden flight. Inside, the world's press wanted to hear Monsieur Tourcard's verdict. The big bird flies, he said. It's the beginning of the big work. If that work goes well, Britain and France stand to make 4,000 million pounds and lead the world of civil aviation.